um, let's just go ahead and let's um, start and dig right in. Um, today we're going to be taking a look at the other part of this um, great drama, this controversy in heaven. Last week we looked at the star of the drama of Revelation, who was Jesus. And here you see a picture, uh, artist rendition of, anyone know who this is? It is Lucifer. Lucifer. He was the, the um, archangel in heaven who stood at the throne and the side of Jesus and God himself. So we're going to take a look at this character and what the Bible has to say about what he did that caused Jesus to actually die on the cross, which we're celebrating this week. Um, now, Satan has many titles. So that's the first thing that we need to understand is that in Bible prophecy, uh, Satan is actually depicted using um, different symbols. So we're going to take a look at Satan's many titles. What are those names? What are those titles that the Bible actually applies to the devil? All right. And in the book of Revelation, um, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, and uh, you can all look at your Bibles um, and in, in when this thing goes to uh, video. If you have your Bibles now, you can quickly turn. If you're really fast, um, I'll talk, and then you can flip through these uh, scriptures. But if you don't, you can write these down, and then you can go back and read these. But in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, whenever we're looking at Satan, he's referred to directly as the devil. So whenever, And this is where it actually comes from. It comes from the book of Revelation. So if you're watching movies or reading books or if you're um, looking at historical documents about, um, about the devil, the devil is applied to Lucifer. It was this archangel who used to be in heaven. And then in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, um, he's also referred to symbolically um, and named as the dragon. So this is an important symbol in, in prophecy. And it applies even in the Old Testament. So whenever you read the book of Daniel or Ezekiel or any of the prophetic books, apocalyptic literature, and then particularly in Revelation, which we're studying right now, when you see the dragon mentioned, it's it, here you see the text. Revelation 12, 9 says that you're talking about Lucifer or Satan. Okay. Revelation 12, 9 also says very directly that the dragon is Satan. So... Think about it. His name was Lucifer. He's referred to as um, the devil, Satan, and the dragon. Okay. Uh, there's another name in, that you'll see pop up in Revelation 12, 9, and that is he's also referred to as the serpent. So um, where do we see that? Um, that first reference of, of Lucifer, well, we see it in the Garden of Eden um, in the book of Genesis, where uh, the serpent uh, was able to beguile and tempt and actually cause Adam and Eve to fall to sin. So uh, Lucifer is equal to the, de the devil, Satan, um, the serpent, the dragon. So these are all equal um, nomenclature or equal names when we're referring to um, Lucifer. Now, I don't like referring to him as Lucifer as much anymore because Lucifer used to be... Um, his name when he was in that perfect state. And we're going to get into this more in, in the next several minutes. Um, he um, is actually uh, referred to as the, de the devil, Satan. So that's how we're going to refer to him here. Um, and then in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, um, another title that's given to him is actually wrapped up in his purpose and his goal when it comes to you and I. So if you were to take a look at the two great powers in the universe, God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, versus Satan and all of his evil angels, okay, and so there's a great battle in heaven. We're going to read about this in the book of Revelation. We're going to really um, draw this, this battle out. Well, he's an accuser, but he's not just an accuser of God, saying that God was unfair, that God was unjust, that, that he should try to dethrone God. He was trying to do a great coup. Um, he's really the accuser of you and me. So if you have these two entities at war, the Bible is very clear that we and as humans, like Adam and Eve, we became the pawns in this great battle, right? And because of Adam and Eve's choice, their free will to follow and, uh, Satan and disobey God, um, Lucifer or Satan, this devil, he is now accusing um, all of humanity that we do not deserve heaven. We do not deserve eternal life. So he will stand as your accuser. He will bring up every horrible thing in your life, all the bad choices in your past, 
he'll 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 make you focus on that one bad thing in your life and make you forget about all of the blessings that God has given you because he is the accuser. Now, where did the devil come from? So Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 and 9, if you want to write this down or if you want to flip to your Bible, if you're in the book of Revelation now, turn to Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. Now, when you read those verses, it's very, very specific about where the devil came from. It says that he came from heaven. Now, many of you know that, but as you know, I've made a commitment to you that I'm not just going to use my words that I'm going to give you the Bible text that actually states exactly where we get our belief system. And our and this is really important, right? We don't just um, come up with our own interpretation. The Bible has to interpret itself. So in Revelation chapter 12, uh, verse 7 through 9, it talks about this great war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. So here we see the dragon is Satan, right? The dragon fought and his angel so this war was where it was happening in heaven so when you look up in the sky you see the stars you see the moon you see the sun um the bible refers to that as sort of the second heaven but there's a third heaven i guess it's like far beyond the galaxy even beyond that galaxy on the edges of the universe i don't even know how far out uh there's that other segment of heaven where god's throne dwells well here's where this great war was happening and um it says that uh um, the dragon prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the dragon was cast out. So here it says that he was cast out from heaven. So here directly from scripture, you see that Satan, um, who was once known as Lucifer, came from heaven. So why did he leave heaven? Well, in Revelation 12, 7, 9, and even uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it actually is very specific on why Lucifer, who is now Satan, left heaven. And the Bible says here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 8, that uh, he prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And then in verse 9 it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the what it, earth. Man, that's horrible, right? Of all the created worlds. He was cast out um, to the earth because he had sin. Okay, now um, we can ask God later on why was he cast out to earth. Maybe he was cast out into the universe and he tried to tempt all the other universe, that um, all the other created beings, and they did not fall. But because earth was newly created with the new creation, Adam and Eve, uh, we noticed that Adam and Eve weren't in the garden very long. And... Um, Satan was able to come here and he was successful in trying to convince these young ones to follow him. Um, so we can ask God later on, but but the Bible says that nevertheless he was cast out of heaven and he's on the earth now because he had sinned. So guess what, folks? The bad news is that um, Satan never left the earth. He was cast from heaven to earth and he's been on this planet now for 6,000 years. And um, his time is drawing very close to an end. This is why we're seeing pandemics. We're seeing tsunamis. We're seeing tornadoes. We're seeing earthquakes everywhere. Did you know right now that there's this big rhetoric going on between the United States and China and Russia? That, um, Russia was trying to test our, our military defensive uh, reaction. So they sent a reconnaissance plane over um, Alaska to see if we had a response time. And uh, sure enough, uh, the United States didn't take them but 30 seconds and two F-22 stealth fighters were up there ready to escort them back. I mean, you know, come on, we're in a pandemic and everyone is suffering. Russia is suffering just as much as we are. And there's still the, the evil of the, of the governments is still who's greatest, who has the biggest military might. And so they're testing all the boundaries and the borders. So there's always these wars and rumors of wars and these conflicts at any given time. Well, guess who's responsible for all of that? That's right. It's Satan and all of his evil angels because he wants to accuse and he wants to wipe out humanity. So let's see where, it's, where it says that. Now, this is a really important um, um, fact here. If you go back in Revelation chapter 12 again and take a look at verse 7 through 10, I'm going to look at verse 10. Um, and okay, wait, here it says here in verse 9, so who was cast out with him? It says the dragon was cast out, Satan, devil, right? The serpent who deceived, he was cast to earth. Now look at this. 
and his angels were cast out with him. Okay, so um, Lucifer, when he was in heaven, he was able to convince, according to the Bible, many of the created angels that used to serve God. And so here we see that when uh, Satan was cast out of heaven, it wasn't just him. Uh, he cast out with him were many, many angels. Now, we don't know how many angels there are, but I can guarantee you this. Probably for every one person on the planet, there's one evil angel that's on your back. Um, now, later on, we're going to talk about how many um, in terms of big numbers that, that is. And there is good news when it comes to that because uh, there's also a lot of good, good angels and there's double the good angels over the bad angels. Okay, but here I just want to show you generally that when Lucifer, Satan now, um, was cast out of heaven, he was not alone. He came to this planet with many evil angels. So guess what? On this planet, it's not just Satan. It's also a ton of evil angels who work in the invisible spiritual world who is manifesting in the physical world and influencing in world governments, in, in uh, families, who's influencing in businesses and schools. We see all the horrors and tragedies happening in the news. All of that has influence because of the, the evil of mankind combined with the evil of Lucifer or Satan and all of his evil angels. And all of that combined, I'm telling you, it's, it's looking pretty bad. So how many angels were actually cast out with him? So this is what I was referring to. If you take a look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 3 and 4, it tells you how many angels came out with Satan. So I'm going to read it, and if you uh, want to find it, you can just uh, read along or follow along. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. So here we're talking about Satan. Having seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. So we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But notice here it says his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Okay, so that third um, part of the stars of heaven, whenever we're referring to stars, we're, we're representing angels. So here it says that Satan's tail of influence was able to take one third of the angels in heaven. Okay, so one third of the angels of heaven. Now, if you look in Revelation chapter 1, if you look at um, 1 and 2, you'll find a key there that says whenever referring to stars, it's referring to angels. Okay. Now, what is the origin of the angels, including Satan? So where did they come from? Where did these angels, these evil angels, as well as good angels, and Lucifer all come from? Well, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, Paul was writing to the Colossians, and he gave us some a hidden secret. Um, in that letter, that epistle that he was writing to them, he mentioned that the angels were created by Jesus. So when you think about the angels and you look at Colossians, it says very clearly that um, Satan, all the evil angels, and all the good angels were created by Jesus. Now, when you take a look at the numbers, um, one third of, of heaven's angels turned evil and they went with Satan out of heaven. How many does that leave in heaven with Jesus now? Think about it. A third left. How many are left in heaven? Two thirds. So that means that for every one bad angel on the planet, there's two good angels in heaven. So every time my family gets together and pray, we always pray for our guardian angels. And I actually visualize them. I visualize our guardian angels guarding every corner of, of our, our home. And I, I see them with their swords drawn, flames of fire. And I, I pray for the Holy Spirit on my home. And um, all of my kids, I pray for my daughters who are uh, my, my eldest. Our eldest daughter is in Chicago. I have another daughter and, his, uh, and her husband down in, um, in, um, in Florida. Um, and then um, our family here, I pray for the angels because the angels will protect and they will fight against the evil angels. So I, I encourage you to, to pray for that as well. Um, the Bible actually promises that um, you already have angels assigned. So we'll, we can talk more about that later. If you have a question, I can send you the text on anything that I'm talking about here. But here, very clearly, Colossians says that angels were created by Jesus. So what was Satan doing in heaven before his fall okay so let's think about that what was satan doing in heaven before his fall we know what he's doing now he's creating all this havoc he's he's the um, author of death he's he's just doing everything he can 
to wipe out the, uh, the human race. But what was he doing in heaven before the fall? And what was his name? So in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14, and write that down. And here's uh, two other texts. So you got three here that I'm going to give you. Um, if you look at that, write down Psalm 80, verse 1, and Isaiah 14, 12. So you need to look at all three of those. It's never good. And this morning, we, we had a very good discussion um, about using scripture. It's important that we use the entire Bible, use multiple texts to confirm what we believe. Don't hinge your entire theology or an entire doctrine on just one, one text. And many times, it's not just one text. It's like one phrase in that text. So here, it's very important that we use a consistent um, of Old and New Testament and Psalms and Proverbs and minor and major prophets to get a general picture of the principle of what God needs us to know. Well, what was his name? And what was... Um, um, what was Satan doing? Well, in Isaiah 14, 12, his name was Lucifer. So you already knew that. Um, but I just want to show you the text where we derive that from. So Isaiah 14, 12 says that his name was Lucifer. And then in Ezekiel 28, 14 and Psalm 80, verse 1, here's one, te um, one thing that you didn't know. He was a covering cherub. Now, when you think about a cherub, a cherub, there, there are two types of angels. You have seraphims. And you have cherubs. And um, cherubs had a unique place because they were closest to the throne of God in the sanctuary, in the, tent, in the tabernacle of God. And um, if you remember the Ark of the Covenant back in the Old Testament, you know where the table of, um, of the Ten Commandments were placed inside. And uh, you had the mercy seat. It, it's, they made a movie about it, um, Indiana Jones and the Ark of the Covenant. So that's actually based on actual history where the uh, where Moses was instructed by God to create the Ark of the Covenant. And there was a mercy seat. It was all made of gold. And it was a box. And inside had Aaron's rod, the Ten Commandments, where it had God's written law uh, with his own finger in stone. It had manna in there. Okay. Um, and then it was covered. And then, um, but there was something unique about it. You remember that there were two angels. They were cherubims, okay? And their wings would come across and it would cover the mercy seat, okay? So there was two angels. It was modeled after a pattern in heaven. And so in heaven, here we see in Ezekiel and Psalm that Lucifer was one of those cherubs. In other words, if you take a look at the most powerful angels that existed, um, obviously you're going to say there was Gabriel. Gabriel was a powerful angel, a messenger. He, he came to um, Daniel. Um, if you're ready, if you're studying with me on Friday nights, you know, we're going to be looking at Gabriel a lot there. Gabriel went to Mary and announced the, the birth of Jesus. Okay, so maybe Gabriel was one of those, but clearly Lucifer was the other cherub. Okay, so he was the one that was at the throne of God. He was the covering cherub. All right, so he had a special role in heaven. Now, just coincidentally on the side, you know, when Lucifer fell and he became Satan, uh, guess who took his spot? Well, we are told in Reve in you just read it in um, we read it in Daniel chapter 12 uh, last week, but we also read it just now that Michael the archangel maybe he's the one that took Lucifer's role. We can we can um, get to heaven um, and we can see if that's true or not. We can just ask God that question. But here we see that in Ezekiel and Psalm that Lucifer is referred to as the covering cherub. Now let's take a look at Lucifer his wisdom and his beauty because here's the thing you know satan wants to throw a lie at everybody in movies and in literature and in in sculpting you know all this art and everything we're, we're we see we're told um a lie and that is we're told that lucifer or satan the devil is this horrible grotesque looking demon and who has big horns coming out of his head and he's carrying a pitchfork. You know, I have no idea what he would do with that pitchfork, but he's carrying this pitchfork. And then he has this tail that's kind of like a little pokey thing uh, with a little triangle. What do you call that? Anyways, it's horrific. You know, he has these fang teeth. You know, this is the vision that um, Satan wants us to believe. And you know why he wants us to believe that? Is because that's not exact. That's not how he looks at all. He is going to deceive everybody in the last days. Okay, so let's take a look at what the Bible says. How does the Bible describe Lucifer before his fall? So go back to Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12 and 17. Write that down. You can see exactly the description of Lucifer 
in an apocalypse literature book called Ezekiel. Ezekiel gives you a history of what it was like before the creation of planet Earth. So in Ezekiel 28, verse 12 through 17, we are told that Lucifer was full of wisdom. In other words, he was smart. He was wise. In other words, he's not dumb. He understood physics. He understood the, the stars in the universe. He understood um, astronomy, chemistry, biology. He understood everything on how everything works. He had knowledge and he had wisdom. Okay? And he was perfect in his beauty. Now, there are many definitions of beauty, but man, can you imagine um, if, if he was beautiful in God's description? I mean, that had to be a beauty beyond beauties. So here it says that Lucifer was perfect in beauty. We see that in verse 12 of that Ezekiel text. And then we find out in verse 13 that every precious stone was thy covering. So um, I don't know exactly how what that means, but maybe he was covered with all of these beautiful gems and he sparkled. So whenever um, he moved and the light and the glory of God, whenever light covered him, it was like a rainbow. And um, you would see um, sapphires and rubies and diamonds and emeralds and every colorful, beautiful thing. Whenever Lucifer moved, every precious stone was his, was his covering. Okay, so um, he, he was beautiful. Also in verse 13, we see that the workmanship of thy pipes. Now what they're talking about there is his vocal cords, okay? The workmanship of thy pipes. So you've heard that Lucifer is the father of music. This is where they get this from. It's this Ezekiel text found in verse 13. The workmanship, in other words, when he was created, God's workmanship of Lucifer, his pipes, his voice, was prepared in the in the day that that was created. So in other words, he had a perfect voice. He was probably a, a singer, a musician, and maybe when he sang, it had multiple voices. I don't know. Maybe he sounded a little bit like... Um, Marvin Gaye, and maybe he sounded like Michael Jackson, or maybe he sounded a little bit like uh, Madonna. I don't know. He had a perfect voice. Whatever vocals you love, that's probably um, Lucifer's voice, and then 10 times better than that, okay, without um, auto-tuning. All right, in verse 15, it says that he was perfect. He was not imperfect. In other words, when God created Lucifer, Lucifer was perfect in every single way. God did not create Satan. We have to be very clear about that. God did not create Satan. He created Lucifer, and Lucifer was perfect, perfect in every way. He was beautiful. He was wise. He had knowledge, and he sat before the throne of God himself. Now, what caused Lucifer then to fall? So that's the great question. In Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 17, and Isaiah 14, verse 12 and 14, they ask a big question. Lucifer, how in the world, with all of the, the wondrous gifts and the perfection that God created you in, how did you fall? What was the reason for your fall? Well, Ezekiel 28, 17 says, because of his brightness, because of his wisdom, and because of his beauty, he became proud. This is why God hates the arrogant and the proud, because it reminds him of Lucifer. Whenever we, we put ourselves up and we say, oh, we're better than that person. Look at all that I have done. You know, even though um, the terrorists attacked the World Trade Center, we are so mighty of a nation, we will build it up. You know what? We missed the warning signs there. And now we have a pandemic. Because we constantly rely on our own uh, knowledge, our own wisdom, our own strength, and we fail to go back to God, this reminds God of Satan. Because of Satan's brightness, his wisdom, his beauty, he became proud. It's, it's better to be humble, right? That's what Jesus says. So because of his pride and his arrogance, we begin to see a, a, um, a self-choice that Lucifer makes. He looked at himself. He was probably walking one day in heaven. He was hanging out with his friends, maybe some angel friends. And um, he was walking by the river of life, probably. And he happened to look in there, and he saw a reflection of himself that of himself there he said "Woo, man you're looking good today right that's probably what Lucifer said and, and in his mind he said you know what I know how everything works look at me I, I'm looking pretty good every time I move there's like a rainbow I'm like my own disco ball right and all the other his best friends the other angels said yeah you know what and he said something in his mind 
he says, you know what? God is not fair. Okay, let's get to that in just a second. Let's also look at, at how um, Isaiah says Lucifer fell. So Isaiah says that pride and self-exaltation caused him to decide that he would be like the most high God. So here's what he said to himself. According to Isaiah, Lucifer was walking around, saw himself as very beautiful, and he says, I am going to be like the most high God. Can you imagine that? The audacity of this created angel to say that he is going to be like God? Okay, that's absolutely crazy, but that's what the Bible says that Lucifer did. Now, I want you to take a look at four points that you need to remember. Number one, 1 John 4.10 says that God loves you. So we're going to reveal this great controversy and how Satan is going to try to bring us down. But don't fret because God says in 1 John 4.10 that God loves you. He loves you, okay? God loves all of his created beings. But the second point is God wants our allegiance through love. In other words, he is not going to force us to be robots. You know, he could have made Lucifer and all the evil angels. He could have made you and I like robots, right? Without the power of free will, without the power of choice. But because he loved us so much, because he loved Lucifer and the angels so much, he said, I want that love and that allegiance and loyalty because they choose to give that to me through their love. Because I love them. I want their love back. And it's a reciprocal relationship. That's what God wanted, right? He could have made us like robots. He could have made Lucifer like robots. But how would that be? Can you imagine? I am in love with God. I am roboto, roboto. Can you imagine that? What kind of life is that? Okay, God gave us the power of free will, the power to choose. Likewise, he gave that same um, um, gift to Lucifer and the evil angels. Why? Because John chapter 14 verse 5 says that God wants our allegiance. He wants our loyalty through our own choice to love God. Now, here's the third point. God actually regrets that we are caught as victims of Satan's tyranny. God is not happy with that because of what Satan has done. God is feeling he felt horrible that uh, we have fallen to that situation. And we are now having to struggle with the problems that he brings. So I'm going to read that for you. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. Now again, those of you who have just tuned in and you didn't hear me, every time I pull up a, per, a verse, write those verses down and you can always go back and review this video um, and, um, and kind of get the, the descriptions of this. But Romans chapter 5 verse 8, I want you to look into the heart of God for a second. Here it says in Romans chapter 5 verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us. In other words, that God uh, gave his full attention and his love to us. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. So here it says, while we were yet um, separate from God, while we were enemies of God, while we had followed um, Satan and we disobeyed God, while we were um, enemies, while we were sinners, it says that Christ died for us. So God regretted that we had fall, uh, we fell victim to Satan and his tyranny. And even in spite of that, God sent his only son to die for us so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So remember, we sinned first and then God gave us eternal life after. Can you imagine that? Okay, so you received all these gifts and promises without anything that you've done. We came into this world as sinners, and yet God provided a way out for us, okay? So that, that's an important text for you to mark. Now, here's the fourth point I want you to remember. In fact, God revealed his concern when he gave his son to save us. And you all know this text. So if you're sitting at your computer or on your phone and you're on a drive, or if you're sitting in, the, in your living room at home eating popcorn while you're watching this, um, let's all re, uh, re say this together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall what? Believe in him will not perish, but have, yes, I heard it. I heard everybody say it at the same time, have everlasting life. Okay, so that's good. So those are points I want you to remember because I'm going to reveal what Revelation has to say. What strategies and characteristics of Satan are revealed in Revelation and other parts of God's word. So now I want you to remember that God loves you. 
God uh, regrets that you are under this situation. Um, God gave you the gift of eternal life, but you just have to choose Christ. Okay, this is an important point I want you to remember because Satan has a strategy. What strategies and what um, um, characteristics, what logistics is Satan using um, against God and against us? Okay, Revelation chapter 12 verse 13 says that it is Satan who will persecute God's people. Now, every time I sign an insurance policy, it says uh, you are insured with the exceptions of uh, what's the list here? Earthquake, tornado, um, tsunami, um, you know, just all these um, natural disasters or other acts of God. Really? Are those really acts of God? According to the Bible, those are acts of Satan. Okay? So, all of the horrible things happening, the death that we're experiencing with this pandemic, all of the wars, the famines, the locusts, all of that is being orchestrated by Satan. All right? And he's doing that because he wants to persecute God's believers. I want you to think about something. People, something um, totally forgot. Before the coronavirus actually hit in Wuhan, China, back in December when we heard about it, do you all remember what was happening in August and September and October? The Chinese government was actually getting Christian pastors and throwing them into prison. They were saying, we're going to rewrite the Bible so it fits the Communist Party. They were shutting down Christian churches and they were going to create a state church. And because of their audacity to um, put their defiance against God, this virus came out. But it wasn't just the Chinese. Let's not be so tough on them because it was also the United States and Europe. Everybody has turned to their own wisdom, their own power, and they forgot about God. And it's this pandemic that's getting us back on our knees and getting us back with our families. But I want you to be clear about this. God is not doing this to persecute us. Satan is the one responsible to persecute God's people. So all of the actions of ISIS and beheading all the Christians in the Middle East, Satan. All of the, the um, situation where um, um, God's people were burned and, and put to the stake and fed to lions during, during the Roman and um, Inquisition and Spanish Inquisition, Satan. All right, it is Satan who has been persecuting God's people throughout all of the ages. But more than that, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, and Revelation 20, verse 8 and 10. So look at those verses. It says that Satan is there to deceive you. In other words, he wants to tell you a white lie. So God, you know, Satan's not going to come up to you and say, oh, come with me. I want to take you to hell. Right? Is that what he's going to say? Or maybe Satan's going to say, come on and play with this because it's going to make you go into pain. I mean, really, that's not how Satan works, right? He's going to say, oh, come on, it's not so bad. Just try it out. It's it's okay. Come on. God said that, but you can. God is forgiving. God will protect you. Just try this for a second. Or he'll use scripture. You know, the Bible says this, and we're going to go ahead and we're just going to do whatever we want. Because we're doing it in the name of God. Okay? Satan will try to deceive everyone, but particularly God's people. And Satan will even use scripture, just like he tried to use scripture on Jesus himself when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness. Now, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, okay? Or sisters, or all of mankind. It doesn't matter. He's the accuser of everyone. In other words, he is keeping tabs, all right? He wants to make sure that no one achieves eternal life. So just as God wants you to be saved, just as God wants your children and your grandchildren to be saved, just as he wants all people to come to Jesus and accept him as our Savior, and it's not that big of a deal. It's not that hard to do. All you have to do is just proclaim Jesus' name. And then have a relationship with them. What is the big deal of that? Why are people so so anti-Jesus? Why so people say, oh, you know, I don't know if I want to do it. Uh, you know, there's all these, these uh, questions all the time. People use every excuse not to go to Jesus. It's the simplest thing in the history of mankind. You don't even have to do anything. You just have to acknowledge, okay? And, and, and Satan will do everything he can to woo you so he can accuse you of all your horrible decisions that you made in your past. 
And there's many of us that made horrible decisions, me included. Okay? And I'm pretty sure that on that judgment day, guess who's going to be the district attorney who's trying to prosecute me? It's going to be Satan. He's going to say, look at everything that he did. Boom, boom, boom. He'll probably have 15 pages in, in eight-point font. Here's what he did. Boom, boom, boom. And you know what? God's going to say, you're right. He's guilty. And then my defense attorney, who happens to be Jesus, is going to stand up and says, he's guilty, but I've taken the price. He goes free. This is why this weekend is important. This weekend of the, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus is everyone's greatest hope. It's everyone's greatest salvation because we all deserve to die. None of us are going to get off free unless you have Jesus to cover you as your district attorney and as the person who took the penalty for all of our sins. That's why he was sacrificed and not me. Praise God for that. Now, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10 tells us that he puts God's people in a prison. So you guys know what I'm talking about here. Uh, when you make these horrible choices, you get into these addictions and you're in a prison. When you make a bad choice, you get racked up with guilt and, you, and it eats away at you and, and it starts to create anger and fear. That's a prison. Okay. Some of us can't, we're so wrapped up in our worries that we can't even sleep at night. Prison. All right. That is what Satan wants to do. He wants to put you in any kind of prison that will keep you from looking to Jesus. Don't let him do it. Just keep looking up because God is in control. Now, Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, again, write all these down. You can look at these later. Revelation 2, 13 tells us that he was the one who killed or martyred God's people. So you might say, oh, those horrible Romans, those horrible Germans, the Nazis, I mean, uh, those horrible blah, blah, whatever, whoever they are that killed and martyred God's people, it was all Satan's fault and his evil angels, okay? That wasn't God. So whenever you see your mother, your grandmother, your child, when they go through suffering like cancer and they, they pass away, you know that first death is a gift from God. What we need to be more concerned about is that second death, which we will get into in a future study, that eternal separation from God, okay? That eternal separation from God is what Lucifer, what Satan wants. He wants everyone to be separated from God. You know what he's like? He's like that soldier who knows he lost and... Um, so and and he knows that his time is coming to an end and so what he's trying to do is he's trying to take down as many people as he can with him and you you've seen movies about this you know there's some people that are like that if i'm going down i'm taking as many people down with me so they'll take their gun and go brrr, you know, take their sword you know just do all crazy stuff and kill as many people as they want that's lucifer satan is going to try to devour as many people in his path as he can and he has a lot of evil angels with the same goal in mind now revelation 12 12 tells us that he is so angry he's so very angry because he lost the war so he is so angry at god that he turns that anger and transfers it onto the remnant of god's church that you know what the remnant means it means that it's god's people in the last days so God has had a people through all of history, from Adam and Eve, even to our last days, okay? We're going to talk about who those remnant people are, because I hope that everyone who's watching this is a part of the remnant, the remnant church, the original church of God. You are the ones, if you are alive during this time, in our time, you may very well get to see the coming of Jesus. I want you to just swallow that for a second. Imagine Jesus could come in your lifetime You'll look and your eyes will behold the coming of Jesus. Man, that's crazy when you think about that. Okay, but Lucifer, Satan, is very angry and uh, he knows his time is short. So guess where he transfers that anger? He took that anger against God and he's now turned it on you. He's turned it on, on the people of God. Okay, those who do God's will. So if you are doing God's will right now, you're part of the remnant. And guess what? You've just been painted with a target. Okay, but don't worry, don't be fearful, because our God is greater than, than uh, Lucifer. You remember, who created um, Satan, or who created Lucifer? It was God. So God can wipe him down, okay? And we're going we're gonna to see that, that that's exactly what's going to happen. John 8, verse 44 in the Gospels, we are told that Satan is a liar, and he is the father of all lies. So everything that you hear from satan and everything that he tries to to say in a white lie it's not true and he's the father of all lies 
Now, let's think for a moment um, what were God's options, okay? So how could, have God, how could God have dealt with, with Lucifer when he rebelled in heaven? When Lucifer got a third of the angels and he, he created this coup in heaven. Okay, so the first thing he could have done was what? He could have destroyed Lucifer. The second choice was he could have just ignored Lucifer and said, oh, yeah, whatever. You know, we'll let him do whatever, okay? So he could have killed him, destroyed him and all the evil angels right there in heaven, not worry about it anymore. Or he could have ignored Lucifer. Or the third is give time for the universe who were watching to see the result of Lucifer's rebellion. So think about it for a second. What would you think the other angels and the other created worlds would have thought if God would have destroyed Lucifer and all of his followers right there in heaven? What do you think the other created universe would have thought? Well, they would have been afraid, right? They would have said, whoa, maybe Lucifer was right. I mean, I can't believe I just saw what just happened. God just killed Lucifer. He was the cherubim that covered the Ark of the Covenant and all of his followers. Uh, yeah, I, I better make sure that I follow God. And every time the angels come in God's presence, they would have been afraid. And remember, God wants our allegiance and loyalty out of love, not out of fear. Now, if he would have ignored Lucifer, guess what would have happened? Then there would have been that sin in heaven, that battle in heaven. There would have been a chaos. God can't have that chaos. He can't have that war in heaven. He can't allow Satan or Lucifer to go from planet to planet trying to, trying to create this great coup. I mean, not even in our own society will we allow that kind of thing to happen. God couldn't allow that to happen either. But God took the higher road. He went with option three. He gave time for Lucifer to go through the, his rebellion so that way the universe and the angels and all the other created beings can see the results of Lucifer's rebellion. And then we can see who is actually right. And let me tell you, Satan has done a horrible job on this planet. He has really showed his hand. We've seen horrible disasters, horrible death, pain, tears, sorrow, so much. So many of you are watching right now. All of the pains that you're going through with your families, with your own health, all of that is because of sin and because of what Satan has done on this planet. So all of that is as a result of this rebellion that, that Lucifer gave. But remember that Jesus came, he died on the cross, and he gave us hope that we're not going to have to endure this much longer. He is coming again, and he will wipe away all tears, all pain, all suffering, a new heaven and a new earth will be recreated and all of Satan and his evil angels will be vanquished. And why can he do that? Because God knows that everyone will say God was righteous, he was right, he was just. And we're going to see this in some text. All right, so Satan's strategy has been exposed. We know now what he wants to do. Let's look in um, this amazing twofold warning that God gives us regarding the devil's most effective, deceptive strategy. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through 15, we are told that Satan will now appear not as how we were told he is with horns and pitchforks and grotesque fangs. On. No, he is going to appear as an angel of light. So again, if you're not, write this down, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Verse 13 through 15. So this is in Corinthians. It's in the gospel. It's in the epistles of the New Testament. In verse 14, it says that in the last days, Satan will appear as an angel of light. Many will think that he's Christ. Okay. He's going to appear as this tremendous, beautiful being. Okay. He will minister. His ministers, um, his evil angels will appear as ministers of righteousness, which means that they're going to come across as Christian pastors. They're going to come across as people able to do miracle healings and speak in tongues and do all of these crazy things that we've never seen before. That's all Satan and his evil angels. This is a warning that we're given in verse 15. So remember, for every Bible teaching, the devil has a counterfeit. So whenever God says something, Satan wants to take that and throw a little white lie in it because he wants to deceive us all. All right. Can Satan really work miracles? What do you think? Do you think that Satan and his angels can do these crazy miracles? Or does he only appear to do miracles? Well, write these down. Revelation 16, verse 13 to 14, 
in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says that in the last days, Satan and his evil angels, his ministers, will go out represented as spirits of devils, and they are working miracles. So they will be able to work miracles. That's why you can't rely on miracles to just to verify whether something is from God. You have to only rely on scripture. So how effective are his miracles in deceiving people? And I read this to you last week, but I'm going to review it again. Matthew 24 verse 24 is the key text, but you'll also find it in Matthew 7, 21 and 23. Satan is going to be so effective in deceiving people that in Matthew 24, it says that if it were possible, that even the very elect will be deceived. Now, who are the very elect? These are people who pray, who have a relationship with God. These are people who study God's word and it says that Satan will be so convincing that he will be able to even deceive those people if it were possible. Now, it says if, which um, implies that it won't be possible, but it could be possible. So that's why you need to continue to study and pray and stay close to the word of God. Because Satan will be so convincing that you could possibly be deceived. Now, in Matthew 7, 21 and 23, it says there it's so effective that in the judgment day, many will think that they are saved until Jesus tells them that they are lost. So there are many people who are coming in the name of Christ, who says, I'm a Christian. I believed in God. I was saved. I went to this evangelistic meeting and I accepted Jesus. I even walked up to the foot of the of the stadium and I prayed and I had tears rolling down my eyes and oh man I thought I was saved and Jesus himself in Matthew 7 verse 21 to 23 says that he, he will tell some of these people depart from me I don't even know you isn't that crazy they were deceived by Satan that's why it's so important I can't even highlight this enough you've got to read God's Word you have to know from the Bible itself what God has to say and not rely on tradition and not rely on other people for your own salvation because Satan will always have a false truth okay and the Bible gives us a warning that Satan will be so effective in his deception that even the very elect could be lost and many who think that they are saved will be lost that's actually pretty crazy when you think about it would Satan ever quote scripture in order to deceive well I mentioned this before in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, and verse 5 and 6, we are told that he would because he quoted scripture when he tried to tempt Jesus. You remember, uh, Jesus was hungry, and, um, you know, he didn't have anything to eat. And what did Satan tell him? See that stone? Turn it into bread. And Jesus, knowing that that was a temptation, said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. So right there, Jesus um, was able to overcome um, that temptation. But notice there that he used scripture. And the other thing is that um, right after that, he took um, Jesus up to the temple and said, hey, throw yourself down from the temple because the Bible tells you that they, God's angels will watch over and minister to you and you won't die. So he was quoting scripture. And Jesus says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. All right, who is Satan particularly infuriated with in these last days? So we kind of mentioned that. Revelation 12, 17, just in review, says that he has um, placed his fury on the remnant or the saints. And uh, this, okay, so write down this text here. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. So I'm going to actually read that because this is one of those key highlight texts. Now, there's some of you who have never studied Revelation before. So all this is pretty brand new, and I'm just throwing a lot of, of text at you because some of us are only used to just looking at two or three texts a week. But um, it's important that everything that comes out of my mouth, at least, is, is being validated through Scripture. So let's take a look at Revelation chapter 12, and look at verse 17. It says, The dragon was wroth with the woman. Now, um, we talked about this last week. Whenever we talk about the woman, we're talking about um, God's church. Okay, whenever we talk about the dragon, we're talking about Satan. So it says there, Satan was angry with the church, okay, the remnant church, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So God had a people, a church, represented by a pure woman. Satan was so angry, represented as a dragon, at, at the woman that he went and made war with the, with the remnant of her seed, her children. So we're talking about the last day church, okay? So it says here, 
um, who are those remnant? Okay, so here's the qualifications for who the true church is. All right, so the true church isn't like, it's not a semantic, like it's not, a, it's not known as the Church of God. It's not known as Latter-day Saints, not known as Seventh-day Adventists, not known as Methodist or Catholic or Lutheran or whatever other name is out there in, in the 200 or 300 some denominations. Okay, what is the qualification to be a part of the remnant church in the last days? So take a look at it here. Um, it says here, these are those who, what? They keep the commandments of God. Man, that's crazy because I was always told that God's commandments were abolished. How can they be abolished when God wrote them himself with his own finger? All right? The Ten Commandments weren't abolished. And in Revelation, it says that the church in the last days will still be keeping the commandments of God. That means all ten. All ten commandments. All right? So if you don't know what the commandments are, go to Exodus chapter 20. And I advise you to keep all of those Ten Commandments, including the Fourth Commandment, which is the Sabbath, which happens to be today. So it says here, these are those who keep the commandments of God. And, notice here, and. So it doesn't say or. It says and. So in other words, you need both. It says they have the testimony of Jesus. Now many people say, oh, I, I have Jesus, but I haven't been baptized that new commandment. I don't do foot washing. I don't do the Lord's Supper and I don't keep the Ten Commandments. But you know what? I, I accept Jesus. Is that enough? What do you think? According to the Bible, you need to keep the commandments of God and you have to have the testimony of Jesus. Now the testimony of Jesus is actually a little bit deeper than you realize. So many people who say they have the testimony of Jesus don't even know what they're talking about. And later on, I'm going to show you that the testimony of Jesus is not just proclaiming Jesus. It's actually having a unique understanding of Jesus through the spirit of prophecy. But we'll get to that in just a minute. The highlight that I want to say here is that God's church in the last days won't have any tags. But they're going to be identified by their actions, their minds, and their heart. And in their actions, their minds, and their heart, right, they're going to be keeping the commandments of God. And they will have the testimony of Jesus. And this is so important. I can't even highlight this more. If you do not believe that Jesus is God, and if you do not believe that he is the way to the Father, then we need to pray for you, and you need to pray. Because he, Jesus, is the only way into heaven. I'm telling you, Jesus is the only way. All right? Now, how can I be certain that Satan will not deceive me? So I just splattered four major texts here. Isaiah 8.20, Acts 17.11, John 7, verse 17. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 through 12. And again, those of you who are joining me for the first time this week, those numbers in the parentheses are page numbers to a King James Version Bible that has an amazing concordance. And um, there's many who are studying this with me. So we have a lot of those Bibles. Um, right now we're all out. But if you'd like that Bible, just type in that little bar there or just send me an email or text. Or just message me privately on Facebook and say, I want that Bible and I want some more studies. And my wife will tabulate that and we'll put that order in as soon as this pandemic lifts. But how can we be certain that Satan will not deceive us? So look at these four texts and you know, when we get offline and you can read those on your own. But here in Isaiah 8.20, it says, I must check my religion by the law and the testimony. So take a look at what you believe. And according to Isaiah, if it doesn't um, testify to the law or the word of God and the testimony written in there, then it's not true religion. All right. So I'm not saying anything bad because obviously I don't know who's watching and I'm not pointing anyone out. All I'm saying is if you don't want to be deceived by Satan and if you don't want to be deceived by man-made religion, because I'm not about religion. You know that, right? Even though I'm a pastor, um, religion is man-made. I'm talking about being the church of God, being spiritual. If you are a part of the church of God, we have to go back to the original. And the original says, according to Isaiah, that you have to go back to the testimony of God found in the word of God in the Bible. And you have to abide by the law of God that he wrote with his own finger. That's what God said himself, Isaiah 8.20. Then in the New Testament, Acts chapter 17 verse 11 says that we must submit all new light. So when we learn something new, like many of you are learning something new right now. Many of you are learning something new on Friday night at 7.30. Tomorrow morning at 9.30 and 11 o'clock, I'm going to be throwing out some other stuff. 
Okay, all of this must be new to you, right? Submit all of that, all that new light to the scrutiny of Scripture. So everything has to be validated through the Bible. And maybe some of you don't know where to find it. This is why every time I talk, one thing that one, one person told me, Pastor, you use way too many scripture. And I say, praise the Lord for that. If you think I'm using too many scriptures, that's because I don't want you to take my word for anything. I want you to go back and read it for yourself. All right. So anything that we hear from the news or from these pastors saying crazy things about having all these Easter services tomorrow. OK, saying that the Bible says that we should do that. Where in the Bible does it say that we put ourselves in harm's danger? OK, submit all new light to the scrutiny of Scripture. All right. John 7 verse 17 says, if I am willing to do Jesus's will, I will know of all doctrine, whether it be of God. So here's the thing. You have to be willing to do what Jesus wants you to, know, to do. You have to pray and ask God for wisdom. This is why when we pray, we pray for, for the Holy Spirit. And we pray that we know what God's will is in our life. And as we are on this journey, God will begin to reveal doctrines to us and shed light on things because we are, we are sincerely studying scripture. We really want to know. We're putting tradition aside. We're putting things that we learned from our parents to the side. Things that we just assumed was right because the majority of the world is doing it. You know what? Let me tell you something. Just because the majority of people do something doesn't mean it's correct. There's so many people that do things that other people do. They're, they're Because of peer pressure, because of tradition, because that's just the way we've been doing it for decades or centuries. Okay, just because people have been doing it for centuries or decades or because our families have done it for who knows however long for generations doesn't make it right. Okay, you have to be able to go back to scripture for yourself and discover light for yourself. Then we are told here in um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 through 12, that we must receive the love of the truth. In other words, um, we want to know the truth. Every time we discover something new, then we love that truth and we say, how can we abide by it? So many of you follow me on my Zips and Nuggets page. Many of you follow me on my Future of Hopes page. Some of you um, um, see some of the things that my family does. And you're, you're saying to yourself, man, I've never seen half of the stuff that Pastor Anderson does. He does the Kaddish on Friday. This is welcoming of the Sabbath. Um, you know, I wear a prayer stall, you know, things that Jews do. Um, and then I do things that Catholics do. I do things that Methodists do. I do things that Baptists do. You know why? Because truth comes from a lot of places. It's all from scripture. Okay, if it comes from scripture and God says do it for generations to come to the end, then do it. Just because the church says, well, we just don't do it because it feels, uh, I don't understand. It doesn't, it's not what I grew up with. Who cares what you grew up with and what, what the tradition says? Do what God has to say. Okay, and, and you have a, a closer walk with God. I tell you, it's awesome when my family gets together and we're able to do um, welcoming in of the Sabbath. And we have a special meal. We light the candles. And all of that wasn't given to Jews. That was given to God's people. Okay, there wasn't even a Jewish nation when that was given. Okay, all of the things that we do, like baptism by immersion, that's not just for the Baptist. Okay, baptism by immersion is symbolic of Jesus' death. When he, when he died on the cross yesterday, over 2,000 years ago, it's some, it's, our baptism is symbolic that when we get into the waters, we are about ready to give up the old person. When we go down into the water, baptism by immersion, this is why sprinkling is not sufficient. And we'll talk more about baptism later in the future thing. I'm just giving you a highlight. When you go down into the water, okay, what's the first thing you do? You hold your breath. <gasps> That's symbolic of death. Okay, that's when Jesus was buried in the tomb. This is the day that he was buried in the tomb. This is Saturday, Sabbath. Even Jesus was keeping the law. Okay, then when you come up out of the water, you take that first breath. <gasps> right, and you're completely purified and cleansed with that water. It's symbolic of a new life in Christ. And when you believe in Jesus and you've given your life to him, baptism is so important because it's that symbol that you've taken on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus as your very own. You see why that's important? That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, unless a man is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So many people say, oh, I've, I've accepted Jesus. It's good enough. I don't need to be baptized. Really? What did Jesus say? You're, you're saying that you know more than Jesus? I mean, come on. All right. Second Thessalonians says, love the truth. 
love the truth. Don't love traditions and what we think is true and what is right. Okay, what dangerous animal is Satan like today and why? Okay, now you might think, oh, yeah, if I look at, a, at an animal, Satan is like a badger, right? Or Satan is like a black widow spider. Or Satan is like a black cat. Or Satan is like a, like a dangerous rattlesnake ready to go. Well, you know what? The Bible in Revelation 12 and 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 has a very interesting description of who Satan is, okay? So um, if you read that, it says that Satan is like a lion. But this is not a normal lion. He's a roaring lion. Now, I don't know if any of you have been to a zoo. And if you've seen a lion in a zoo, it's pretty um, anticlimactic, right? Because they're just sitting there sleeping. And they're not doing anything. But you'll oftentimes get that rare time when the lion does a little yawn with a little, not a roar, but like a growl. And when he does it, it's so guttural, it makes it echo in that whole area. Like, rawr, right? And that little bit is enough to like make your, like, take notice. Okay, now... If you've never seen a roaring lion, I have some people in my church who are from Africa, and um, I don't know if Brother Owen is on right now, but he tells me that he's had experience in his tribe there in Africa of roaring lions, and he said it is one of the most frightful things that he's ever that you would ever see, because these are lions who, like they really, you know, they, and it freaks you out. Okay, Satan is like that. He is not a regular docile lion. He is a roaring lion because he knows his time is short and he wants to devour us. He wants to cut you up. He wants to shred you into pieces. You remember that story of Daniel when um, when he was thrown into the lion's den and God shut his mouth up? And many people said, oh, well, maybe the, the lions weren't hungry. Okay, well, look at what happened the night after. Daniel wasn't harmed. He was brought out. And those people who have falsely accused him were thrown into the lion's den. And guess what happened to them? Read the story in Daniel. Those lions were so hungry that they ripped those people into shreds. I mean, before they even hit the ground, they were already devoured. That is crazy. Okay, that is like Satan. Satan is going to rip us to shreds if he can before we even hit the ground because he knows that his time is short. And let me tell you something, friends. We're in a pandemic right now. Do you think that we're near the end time? Do you think that Satan knows that we're in the end time? Guess what he's going to be doing? He's going to do everything possible to bring people down. Okay, so don't follow the false teachers. Now, Satan's final fate. I promised you that we would talk a little bit about where Satan is going to end up. Where will Satan finally be placed? Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 tells us that he will be placed in the lake of fire and brimstone. In the lake of fire and brimstone and if you want to see that text again it's revelation chapter 20 verse 10 so um again write these texts down you can look at revelation 20 verse 10 or you can go back and review this when this posts as a video and you can hear um you can get these texts more but here it says that satan's final end result is going to be placed in the lake of fire and brimstone and what will the fire do to him and what will be the result so we see here Two interesting texts. Many people don't even realize that the book of Hebrews um, talks about the final end of Satan. And uh, many people rarely go to Ezekiel chapter 28 in particular. And um, here we see in Ezekiel and in Hebrews um, the doom of Satan. So what will the fire do to Satan and what would be the results? So let's take a look at that. Ezekiel 28, 18 says that it will turn Satan into ashes in other words there is a final end for satan he'll be into ashes now uh, when i do campfire and that wood turns to ashes you know i just take a little rock and everything and i can just like hit it and it just turns into ashes like dust okay that's going to be lucifer satan's final end in hebrews we see that he will be destroyed by jesus so satan thought that when he crucified jesus yesterday that was good friday he was probably having this great party woohoo woohoo we won we won and all the evil angels were like, like railing and saying oh yeah look at that we we won god we won god that was friday but sunday was coming tomorrow at sunrise why do christians get up so early in the morning to watch the sunrise because that's when jesus rose from the tomb and guess what what satan's reaction was when jesus came out of the tomb you know what his reaction was 
Yeah, his draw dropped to the ground. Okay, because he realized at that moment he was doomed, man. He was his his time was short. And here in Hebrews it says he will be destroyed by the one that he thought he destroyed. Jesus will come and bring an end to Satan. Okay? Now Ezekiel 28:19 tells us then never shalt thou be any more. In other words, Satan is not going to be this phoenix who will come up from his ashes and become like this fiery dragon again. No. The Bible says that when God takes care of Satan, that's it. Gone. Okay? In, in Tagalog, you know, my dad is from the Philippines. And those of you who are joining me from the Philippines, welcome. Um, there's a, a statement that they say, Walang, wala, wala, wala. That means no more. Right, and when they say "wala," when a Filipino says it, it's like, it's like final, like "wala," no more. Right? Well, likewise, when God says that's it, never Satan won't come up again. Now, how can we defeat this, the the devil? In the meantime, while you and I are living on this planet, how can you and I defeat the devil? Well, Revelation chapter twelve, verse eleven says this. I'm gonna read it. You can look at this um, and follow along with me if you have it. Revelation 12, 11 says, and they overcame him. Okay. Okay. So here's the thing. I want to tell you something. So there was a person last night. I told you about it. Um, his girlfriend and his, his friends are dealing with this demonic activity happening in their, in their house, in, the, in their apartment. Okay. And he, he um, texted me and he said, Pastor, what do we do? Okay. And I, I told him two things. First of all, um, that you probably wouldn't expect. First of all, Satan is not interested in a house. You realize that, right? Satan doesn't care about a house. He really cares about people in the house. So if there's something that needs to be repented of, if there's an evil thing like people playing with Ouija boards or seances, you got to get rid of all of those idols, all of that stuff. Then we need to pray. So look at what it says here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Okay, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So the only way that we can defeat Satan is by the blood of Jesus. You have to invoke Jesus' name. So you know what I told him? I said, um, what you need to do, as crazy as this sound, is sing, Jesus loves me. And I used an example. I didn't tell the name of the person, but there's someone else um, in my church who's, who, who dealt with this demonic activity. And it was a small boy who was so uh, afraid that, and he was singing ghosts and apparitions. And, um, and he told him, sing, Jesus loves me. Imagine that. You know, for some reason, Satan hates that song. So think about it. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. Now listen to this. Yes, Jesus loves me. Satan would go, oh, oh. Yes, Jesus loves me. Oh, I can't stand it. Yes, Jesus loves me. Man, you invoke Jesus' name four or five times. Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Invoke the word of God, the blood of the Lamb, and in the name of Jesus, Satan will flee. Evil will flee. There's something about the blood and sacrifice of Jesus and the name of God that even the evil angels cannot stand. By the word of our testimony, think about what God has done for you. I praise God for his salvation. I praise God for my family. I praise God for music. Play God music. Play Christian music. Sing Jesus loves me. This I know. Sing amazing grace. And by the word of your testimony in God and giving glory to God and, and, going, um, and going back to the sacrifice of Jesus, Satan will be overcome. Because it says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives even unto death. In other words, we belong to God. What can Satan do to me? Right? God, you, we belong to you. Save us, please, in the name of your son. Now, we must be willing to give our life rather than knowingly dishonor the great God of heaven. If you are willing to die for what God has done for you, then guess what? 
God will, will come through for you. Now, in the light of Jesus' matchless love for you, there's nothing that you can do really to equal that, you know? And this Easter weekend, in, the, in light of this pandemic, it really makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? That we really are not in control of what happens on this planet. We are really up against an enemy that has control over the weather, has control over the planet, over government and powers, it seems. He's influencing there. But I want you to know that God is bigger than all of that. And in light of Jesus' matchless love for you right now and his blessed invitation of Revelation 22, 17 for you. Okay, so I'm going to read that to you. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. And I want you to think on these words. Okay, Revelation 22, 17. And the spirit and the bride came, said, come, let him that hear it say, come, and let him and her that a thirst come and whosoever will let him or her take of the life the water of life freely Jesus is inviting you right now to come to him he wants you to be his child and if you are willing to decide to come to him right now and if you're willing to ask Jesus to, to uh, take over your life and control your life if you're willing to do that right now he will come to you right now are you willing to bear testimony to others of God's love and his power? Are you so happy of the sacrifice that God has done for you and that you will bear testimony to what God has done for you? Jesus says, come to me now. Are you willing to consider your relationship with Jesus? Because it's really a matter of life and death. If you're willing to consider, Lord, I want to draw closer to you, particularly during this time. How do I do that? If you are willing to do that, then he says, come, and I will meet you there. I will meet you at the foot of the cross. If this is your desire, I want to invite you to pray with me. Father in heaven, I pray for all those who are with me right now. Those who are watching live, I pray that you will enter into their life, send them the Holy Spirit. They are wanting to come into a deeper relationship with you. Lord, we know we're under such great troubles right now but we know that you are more powerful and that there is a brighter future ahead so father in jesus name we know that you love us and we pray lord that we can be able to have that relationship with you because we love you father we pray for this in jesus name amen